Good morning, everyone. This is Julie McDonald with Microcom Technologies, and I'd like to thank all of you for attending today's webinar with MetaGeek. Today's host is Joel Crane, and he'll be presenting. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to submit them in the question box, and Joel will answer them at the end of today's presentation. Joel, I'm finished for now. Please go ahead and take it over. Great. Thanks, Julie. Welcome to Visual Spectrum Analysis with Channelizer and YSpy. In this webinar, I'm going to show you how you can use spectrum analysis to solve some common problems that you might see in Wi-Fi. One of the biggest problems being non-Wi-Fi interference, as well as uh, oversaturation on a wireless channel. Uh, just a, a bit of an interest so you know a bit about me, who I am, and what I do. My name is Joel, and I take care of all technical training functions here at MetaGeek. So I basically train all of our customers on how to use our products and how to, how to uh, deploy and troubleshoot wireless networks. Um, I've got a few certifications, and one that I want to point out to you is these four here at the end. These come from the CWNP program. That's the Certified Wireless Network Professional Program. I strongly recommend that you check out the CWNP program, starting with the CWNA. That's kind of the first certification that you want to get. It's a great, great certification for Wi-Fi. And if you want to learn more after this presentation, the first place I would go is head over to Amazon and grab yourself a copy of the CWNA Study Guide. It's a great book. Uh, I still refer to it regularly. I kind of see it as my Wi-Fi Bible. I go back to that all the time. So the CWMP program, I highly recommend checking that out if you want to learn more about Wi-Fi um, at the uh, end of this presentation. Just so that you know kind of what's coming up in this presentation, uh, we're going to start out by going over some basics. There's some kind of core concepts. There's some fundamental things about Wi-Fi that you really have to understand to get spectrum analysis. And so we're going to spend just a few slides on those. We'll start by looking at those core fundamentals, and then we'll jump into a, a time of live demo using uh, using Channelizer and the Wi-Fi live in my environment here at MetaGeek. And then we'll wrap up by taking a look at some common, uh, some common devices, some common interferers that you might see in the spectrum. And then we'll finish up with questions. So let's go ahead and get started on those fundamentals. The first thing I want to talk about is the half duplex nature of Wi-Fi. Now, I talk about this whenever I talk about Wi-Fi with a new group of people. I always start with this concept because this is the cornerstone. This is the building block. The most important thing that you can possibly understand about Wi-Fi is the half duplex nature of it. So Wi-Fi is a little bit different from an Ethernet cable. If you've ever uh, stripped back the, the shielding on an Ethernet cable, you may have noticed that there's actually four pairs of copper wires inside one Ethernet cable. There's four twisted pairs of copper inside that Ethernet cable. And that affords us full duplex connectivity. That allows us to basically send traffic in two directions at the same time on one Ethernet cable. It's kind of like a two-lane highway where we can send traffic east and west simultaneously. Wi-Fi is a little bit different though in that Wi-Fi is half duplex, which means only one device can talk on a channel at a time. If we've got a, a wireless access point and if we've got a client device on the same channel, if they both try to talk at the same time, they're basically just going to cancel each other out. It's just like a human conversation. If you're talking to a friend and you say something and your friend says something at the exact same time, you're going to cancel each other out and neither of you will be able to understand the other. Wi-Fi is the exact same way. Only one device can talk on a channel at a time. So what does a wireless conversation typically look like? Well, let's say that we have an access point that needs to send some data to this laptop, this client device. The first thing the access point's gonna do is it's gonna perform a clear channel assessment. It's basically gonna listen to the channel to see if anything is talking on the channel. And if there's nothing talking on the channel, it's gonna take that opportunity to transmit. So it will, it will transmit that data to the laptop on the other side. Now the laptop's gonna take a look at that data and make sure that it understood it and it'll go, yep, check, I understood that data and then it will reply with an acknowledgement. It's this constant process of sending data and receiving an, an acknowledgement. Sending data and receiving an acknowledgement over and over and over again. Now, um, when we've got more than one device on a channel, let's kind of zoom out, let's kind of pull back a little bit and think about an entire channel. Instead of just one access point and one client device, let's think about what an entire channel looks like. Let's say that we've got a bunch of different devices and they're all on the same channel, and we've got an Android phone here that is transmitting some data to this laptop. When that data transmission is occurring, all of these other devices on the channel have to be quiet and wait for their turn to talk. They're gonna notice that something is talking and they're just gonna simply back off and be quiet and wait for their turn to talk. 
Remember, only one device can talk on a channel at a time. At any given time, on any given channel, one device can talk. And that's true of the neighbors as well. If there's a neighboring network, maybe uh, you've got a neighbor next door and they've got an access point and they've got a few wireless devices. If they're on the same channel as you, then they all have to take turns talking with you as well. Anything in range has to be quiet and wait for an opportunity to talk on a wireless channel. We've also got to think about non-Wi-Fi interference as well. Non-Wi-Fi uh, interference can come from just about anything that's in either the 2.4 or the 5 gigahertz band. That means cordless phones, wireless video cameras, microwave ovens, baby monitors. They all use the same frequencies. They all use the same channels as Wi-Fi, the same frequency bands. And so they can potentially cause interference for a wireless device. So let's take a look at what that might look like. Now in this example, I'm going to use the classic example. This is a microwave oven. And th these are just the classic interfere with Wi-Fi because microwave ovens cook food by bombarding it with 2.4 gigahertz. That's, that's how they cook food. And uh, don't worry before you panic or freak out or anything like that. If you look closely at a microwave oven, especially in the front of the microwave oven, you'll notice that there's a metal mesh in there. And that actually contains all of that radio frequency activity so that we're microwaving a burrito and not microwaving you as you stand in front of it. So microwaves do a pretty good job of containing all of that that RF energy, all of that radio frequency energy. But on some microwaves, especially an older microwave where maybe the seal around the door isn't as good as it used to be, or maybe the hinge is a little bit bent from you know hitting it with your hip too many times as you close the microwave, as you walk away with your hot plate of food, those microwave ovens might start to leak out a little bit of RF energy, just a little bit. And when that happens, a microwave basically starts spewing out garbage all over your all over your wireless channels, all over your 2.4 gigahertz channels where your Wi-Fi devices are located. And when that happens, the problem with that is that our Wi-Fi devices are super polite. If they see anything on its, if they see anything start generating activity on its channel, the Wi-Fi devices will go, okay, well, only one device can talk at a time, so I'm just going to back off and be quiet. So as soon as you throw a burrito into the microwave oven and mash the 30-second button a few times, and it starts spewing out garbage into 2.4 gigahertz, if it's bad enough, then those wireless devices, our Wi-Fi devices, will just throw up their hands, and they will simply be quiet. They will back off, and they will wait for their opportunity to talk. On any given channel, at any given time, only one device can talk, and that includes non-Wi-Fi devices as well, and our Wi-Fi devices will simply back off and be quiet and give precedence to those, those non-Wi-Fi devices. Speaking of 2.4 gigahertz, I want to make a quick comparison between the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands. 2.4 gigahertz, uh, as you all know, has a much greater range than the 5 gigahertz band. Most vendors are going to advertise about a 300 foot range, but that varies a lot depending on your environment. That varies depending on the materials of the building you're in, how many people are in the building can even affect that, what types of antennas you're using on the access points, and even uh, what kind of client devices you're using. It's going to vary all over the place, but typically you're going to see about a 300 foot range. Whereas in the 5 gigahertz band, we see a much lower indoor range. We only see about a 90 foot range indoors. Now, why is that exactly? Well, it's because of the frequency band, which determines how long the wavelengths actually are. In the 2.4 gigahertz band, we get a nice long wavelength that does a pretty good job of punching through stuff. It goes through things like doors and walls and filing cabinets and things like that fairly well. Whereas 5 gigahertz, since it's a higher frequency, that wavelength is a lot shorter. So it doesn't do nearly, of a, nearly as good of a job of punching through stuff. So it gets blocked or attenuated more by obstacles in its path. So the result is that 5 gigahertz only has about a 90 foot range because of that difference in wavelength. The 2.4 gigahertz band is also pretty much universally compatible. Pretty much everything out there supports 2.4 gigahertz. That's the first frequency band where the 802.11 standard existed was in 2.4, and that's just kind of persisted till until today where the majority of devices out there support the 2.4 gigahertz. In fact, pretty much everything that has a Wi-Fi logo on it or says that it supports Wi-Fi supports the 2.4 gigahertz band, whereas 5 gigahertz as a frequency band just isn't as popular for Wi-Fi. There's still a lot of devices out there that don't support the 5 gigahertz band. While there are lots of newer devices and premium devices like maybe your, you know, your, uh, your new MacBooks, your MacBook Airs, your MacBook Pros, um, kind of flagship phones like, uh, like the Gal Galaxy S8 supports the 5 gigahertz band, uh, the Nexus 5X and the, and the Google Pixel, they all support 5 gigahertz. But a lot of your older or budget devices don't support the 5 gigahertz, so we see limited compatibility in the 5 gigahertz band. And uh, perhaps the biggest problem 
problem, one of the biggest problems anyway, with 2.4 is that it is highly congested with Wi-Fi. There's tons of Wi-Fi devices there, and it's plagued with non-Wi-Fi interference. Things like cordless phones, wireless video cameras, microwave ovens, baby monitors, the list goes on and on and on. The thing that bugs me about 2.4 gigahertz the most, though, compared to 5 gigahertz, is that it has only three non-overlapping channels. There's only three channels to work with, whereas in the 5 gigahertz band, we have 24 non-overlapping channels. Now, earlier we talked about how only one device can talk on a channel at a time because of the half-duplex nature of Wi-Fi. That means that each channel has a limited amount of capacity available on that channel. There is a ceiling to how much capacity you can have on a wireless channel. And if there's only three channels in 2.4 gigahertz, that means that we only have three channels worth of capacity. Whereas in the five gigahertz band, we have 24 whole channels of capacity to work with. So there's a lot more capacity for a lot more potential throughput. Now, one thing you might be thinking to yourself is, okay, hang on a second, Joel. You're telling me that there's only three channels in the 2.4 gigahertz band. I've configured a few access points and routers in my day. Pretty sure there's more, more than three channels in 2.4. Well, you're right, but here's the problem. The problem is that each Wi-Fi channel is 20 megahertz wide. That's the total width of each channel in the 2.4 gigahertz band and the five gigahertz band for that matter. But the problem is, is that in the entire 2.4 gigahertz band, at least what we're allowed to use for Wi-Fi in the United States, there's only about 60 megahertz of bandwidth here. So you do some math really quick. You do you know 20, uh, or you do 60 divided by 20. You realize there's only enough room in the 2.4 gigahertz band for three Wi-Fi channels. So how is it that we get 11 channels in 2.4 gigahertz when there's really only enough room for three? Well, it comes down to how the channels are laid out. Um, each channel is marked by its center. So here's the center of channel one, and each channel center is only separated by five megahertz. So if we start at the center of channel one and we go up five megahertz, that puts us right here at the center of channel two. And if they're 20 megahertz wide, we realize when we visualize this, that each, uh, that each of these two channels, one, channels one and two, overlap by about 75%. In the end, there's only three channels that do not overlap, and that is channels one, six, and 11. Okay, so the next question that you might have is, well, that's great, but why does it matter? Why does it matter if networks are on partially over, overlapping channels? Why does it matter if channels partially overlap? Well, it matters because of how Wi-Fi can interfere with itself. There's actually three types of interference that we need to watch out for in Wi-Fi. The first is co-channel interference. Co-channel interference occurs when we've got an access point and a few client devices all sharing the same channel. Basically, any Wi-Fi device of any kind that is on the same channel is going to have to take turns talking because only one device can talk on a channel at a time. With co-channel interference, every client and access point on the same channel is going to compete for time to talk. Think of it kind of like a dinner table conversation. If you have maybe four people sitting, sitting around a dinner table, you're all gonna get plenty of opportunities to talk. You're all gonna get an opportunity to participate in the conversation, to give some input, to say what you want to say. But if you put a lot of people around a dinner table, maybe you get together with the in-laws or maybe you get together with your family at Christmas time. You know, that's when they, that's when they pull out the card table and they put that on the end of, uh, of the dinner table and they stretch out the dinner table and put a whole bunch of leaves in the dinner table to make it as big as possible. And you fit everybody around one giant dinner table then everybody starts talking and it can be really difficult to get a word in. It can be very, very difficult to get an opportunity to talk because there's so many people at the table that you can't get an opportunity to talk. That's what co-channel interference is. Co-channel interference is just fine as long as we don't get too many devices on the channel uh, trying to get an opportunity to talk because only one device can talk on a channel at a time. The next type of interference is adjacent channel interference. Adjacent channel interference occurs when we have access points and client devices that are on partially overlapping channels. So for example, we might have an access point and a few devices on channel five, and another access point and a few devices on channel six, and an access point and a few other devices on channel seven. The problem is that all three of these uh, access points and all of their connected client devices are all on partially overlapping channels. So instead of politely taking turns talking with each other, these devices are just going to yell and scream 
over each other. They're just going to interrupt each other constantly, which means they're going to have to retransmit what they just tried to send, and it just turns into a big yelling match. It's just like the dinner table conversation, but in this, but in this analogy, instead of being at a dinner table in your home where you have to take turns talking with people around the dinner table in your house, now we're talking about a dinner table at a restaurant. At a restaurant, you'll take turns talking politely with the people at your dinner table, but there's other people at other dinner tables around you, and they're not taking turns talking with you, but you can still hear them. So to compensate, if it's a noisy restaurant, you'll have to talk a bit louder, and then they'll have to talk a bit louder, and then you'll have to talk a bit louder, and pretty soon you're yelling at the people at your table, and they still can't understand what you're trying to say, and you'll have to repeat yourselves regularly. Adjacent channel interference is bad, 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 bad. We want to avoid adjacent channel interference at all costs, and we can do that by sticking to the golden rule of Wi-Fi, which is to always use channels 1, 6, and 11. If we all use channels 1, 6, and 11 everywhere all the time, then adjacent channel interference would go away and we would never have that problem ever again. Now, the third type of interference that we have to watch out for, and that's going to be the main focus of this webinar, is non-Wi-Fi interference. Non-Wi-Fi interference comes from things like microwave ovens and cordless phones and wireless video cameras and baby monitors and Bluetooth devices and Xbox 360 controllers. And I could go on for several minutes. There's tons of stuff in 2.4 that can potentially interfere with our wireless networks. And so we've got to watch out for those. The problem with non-Wi-Fi that more non-802.11 devices is that they don't have the same politeness mechanisms built in that Wi-Fi does. Wi-Fi will very politely check the channel and see if anything is talking. And if something is talking on that channel, it'll back off and be quiet and wait for a turn to talk. But an old X10 wireless video camera, they don't care. They just jump on the channel and they just start spewing garbage all over the channel. And when our Wi-Fi devices see that, they're going to go, oh, something's talking, and they'll just back off and be quiet and wait for an opportunity to talk. Only one device can talk on a channel at a time, and that includes non-Wi-Fi devices as well. So how do we detect interference? Well, there's kind of two classic ways of doing this. The, the real classic way of doing this is with a Wi-Fi scanner. A Wi-Fi scanner uses a normal, plain old, built-in Wi-Fi adapter on your laptop or on your smartphone to scan for wireless networks. So it's going to be something that's built into your laptop. Maybe it's a USB one that plugs in, depending on, on your setup and what you have. But this is just a normal, off-the-shelf Wi-Fi adapter. The problem with a Wi-Fi adapter is, while they can give us some interesting information about, you know, maybe signal strength, or maybe how many networks are on each channel, or if anyone is partially overlapping, while it gives us some very interesting information about that, the problem with this is it doesn't tell us how busy each wireless channel actually is. For example, in here in this example, we've got a couple of networks here on channel one, but that's all we know. I mean, how often is that channel being used? Really, we don't know. Is there some non-Wi-Fi interference up here on channel 11? We don't know. The problem is that a Wi-Fi adapter only speaks Wi-Fi, and so it can't tell us how busy a channel is, and it can't tell us if there's any non-Wi-Fi interference present that could wreck our wireless network. And that's where spectrum analysis comes in. Spectrum analysis means using a special piece of hardware. In our case here, that's the Y-SPY. The Y-SPY is a very special piece of hardware called a spectrum analyzer. It's able to hear all of the raw radio frequency activity in our environment. Not just Wi-Fi, but everything. It can hear the cordless phones and the wireless video cameras. And every time a Wi-Fi device talks, we can see that too. We can see all of that activity. So the two big things that we get from this is we get to see interference from non-802.11 devices. That means non-Wi-Fi devices. We can see those devices and we can, uh, we can use this to identify them and go track them down and get rid of them so that they don't interfere with our wireless networks. It also shows us 802.11 channel congestion. So if we see a bunch of congestion on a Wi-Fi wi channel, then we know, oh, that channel's being used maybe 40% of the time. That means there's only 60% of the channel left available for Wi-Fi devices to use. That could cause a performance problem. And so that's what we get to see with a, uh, with a spectrum analyzer. I always like to start with the physical layer. And, I, and starting with the physical layer means using spectrum analysis first. The physical layer in the OSI model refers to the raw radio frequency activity going through the air. Now, if we were talking about an Ethernet cable, the physical layer is copper between two Ethernet connected devices, right? That's the cable with those twisted pairs of copper inside the cable. And if you're working on an Ethernet problem, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to check the cable. Maybe you're going to replace the cable just to make sure that's not the problem. Maybe you have a fancy cable tester that you're going to use to test and see if the cable works. In Wi-Fi, the spectrum 
is the cable. So we need to take a look at the spectrum and make sure there's not something blocking our transmissions between devices. And so I'm always going to start with the physical layer and I'm going to use spectrum analysis to guide me to the next troubleshooting step. So here's the one of one of two things, maybe option one and option two of what we might see on a spectrum analyzer. Option one is we might see this non-Wi-Fi signature. So we can look at this signature and go, oh, that does not look like Wi-Fi. That is a non-Wi-Fi device of some kind. We can use spectrum analysis to identify and remove non-Wi-Fi interference. So we can identify what this device is, we can go track it down and we can get rid of it. And I'll show you how to do that today. The second thing that we might see is we might see a Wi-Fi signature. This is what Wi-Fi looks like in the spectrum it makes this flat tabletop shape with these shoulders down each side and if we see that then we can go oh there's some there's a bunch of wi-fi activity on the channel and i can tell that that channel is being over utilized it's being used too heavily and so at that point that's when i'm going to split off to a different tool that's when i might use packet analysis to look at layer two to actually look at at the uh, at, at that data flying back and forth between devices to dig deeper into that Wi-Fi congestion. But I'm always going to start with layer one because that's going to lead me to what I need to do next. Okay, so with that, uh, I don't know about you, but I think I'm ready to be done with some slides for now. So let's go ahead and, and perform, uh, let's go ahead and do a live demo in our environment right now. So I'm going to go ahead and start up my spectrum analysis tool really quick here. So I'll just take a moment to start it up. And in this example, I'm using a, a MetaGeek Wi-Spy DDX. And that is plugged into a copy of Channelizer. And then I'm also using a, uh, I'm also using a USB Wi-Fi adapter to get my Wi-Fi scanning data um, into, into Windows. Now, you might have a USB Wi-Fi adapter built in on your laptop. In this case, I don't have one built into this machine here. And so I'm just using a USB Wi-Fi adapter. Okay, so let's go ahead and get Channelizer set up for what we need to do with it today. And that's going to be to look at some, some non-Wi-Fi interference. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to switch over to the networks table tab here, and we'll come back and look at that here in a few minutes. And then I'm actually going to hide all of our selected networks right now. We can actually see all of our wireless networks here, but I'm going to hide those, and we'll come back to those here in just a few minutes. I'm also going to hide color by utilization. I just want to leave this current trace enabled. That's this blue line that you see here in the spectrum. That blue line shows us all of the raw radio frequency activity in our environment right now. So with that blue line, we can see some interesting information about what is going on in the spectrum. First off, we can see where it's happening. If it's happening at the top of the band, we'll see it over here on the right hand side. If it's happening at a lower frequency at the bottom of the band, we'll see it over here on the left hand side. So we can see where the activity is occurring. We can also see how loud it is based on the height. So if we see a really tall spike, then that tells me that that's something that's either really loud or really close by. If we see a short spike, something that's not as tall, that tells me that it's either a, a, a less powerful transmitter or we're just not as close to it. So the height tells us signal strength or amplitude. Think of amplitude as loudness. I kind of like to uh, compare uh, this visualization to uh, a, an old program I used to run back in the Windows 95, maybe Windows 98 days. Back then, I had a, a tool called Winamp. Winamp was an MP3 player tool long before iTunes or any of those newer things, long before we had uh, any good mobile MP3 players like the iPod or anything like that. Winamp was an MP3 playback tool, and it visualized music with a spectrum analyzer, just like this one. So if, you, if there were a bunch of low notes being played in the song, you'd see a bunch of spikes down here at the bottom of the graph. And if, you saw a bunch of, if there were a bunch of high notes being played, you'd see a bunch of spikes up here at the top of the graph. The audio visualizer in Winamp is, for all intents and purposes, a spectrum analyzer. It's just like this spectrum analyzer, except this spectrum analyzer is looking at radio spectrum instead of audio spectrum. Ultimately, it's the exact same thing. Now, I don't know about you, but that blue line is actually kind of difficult for me to keep track of. I kind of have a hard time keeping up with what's going on on that blue line. So I like to enable another view called, uh, called color by utilization. Color by utilization uses color to show us how often things are talking in the spectrum. So we can use that color to see exactly how often we detected energy there. So for example, let's go through all of these colors really quick. Blue indicates uh, blue indicates that something talked there, but it only talked there 10% of the time or less. So zero to 10% of the time, 
uh, is colored in blue. Think of it as kind of like a clap. If you, if somebody was was to walk into my my little studio here where I'm giving my webinar, and they were just to walk in and clap one time, kind of like this. Would that really interrupt our conversation? No, not really. I mean, I would think it's kind of weird because I'm trying to give a webinar right now. I would wonder why did you do that? But it wouldn't really interrupt our conversation because blue just means that there was a clap there just for a short amount of time. There was some activity there and it was there and it was gone very, very quickly. Okay, so let's work our way up to the colors now. Green indicates that something is talking there about 20% of the time. So something's a little, it's a little bit busier there, but still not terrible. Yellow, I'm gonna have to go across my blue one here. Yellow indicates that something talked there about 40% of the time and red means that something talked there 50% of the time or more. So somewhere between 50 and 100% of the time. This is called utilization or how often is the spectrum being used or utilized. And so we can see the utilization based on, uh, based on the color. If you see red, red indicates constant activity, kind of like an air horn. Whereas a clap doesn't really interrupt our webinar right now. See, no problem, doesn't really interrupt our webinar. If somebody walked in here and just emptied out an entire air horn, that would absolutely interrupt our webinar. So I've been giving these webinars for, uh, for several years now and that hasn't happened yet, surprisingly. No one's walked in here with an air horn yet. So I don't know, don't tell any of my coworkers that I use that analogy or it, it might happen, you never know. So, um, so we can use that color to see how often things are talking. Blue is like a clap, red is like an air horn. It's gonna completely shut down any wireless networks that happen to be on the same channel. Speaking of wireless networks, let's take a look at how we can see where our networks are in the spectrum, how we can see where they are in the spectrum. Through the power of Wi-Fi scanning that's built into Channelizer, this data doesn't come from the Wi-Fi, it comes from your, your Wi-Fi adapter on your machine. We can actually visualize where our wireless networks are in the spectrum. Each one of these boxes represents a wireless network. We can see based on the height, how loud that network is, and we can see which channel it's on and how it's overlapping with other networks. Now, there's a lot of networks there, but there's only one that I'm really concerned about. I'm concerned about one called MetaGeek. So I'm actually gonna just type in a filter here, and I'm gonna hit enter, and that's gonna filter down to only the access points that belong to the MetaGeek network. So you can see that we've got a couple of access points here. We've got our reception, and then we've got one back here in a meeting room called, it's called the Plank. And, uh, and so uh, the, the whole meeting, meeting room is uh, you know, done up in wood, so we call it the plank. So, that, uh, so we can actually see where those two access points are in the spectrum. And curiously, they both have exactly the same signal strength based on where I'm sitting right now. So now, if there is any non-Wi-Fi interference, we will be able to see whether it is going to interfere with our wireless network or not. So let's have some fun. I'm gonna introduce some non-Wi-Fi interference here, and it's not gonna take you very long to spot it. It's not gonna take you very long at all to see the big spike that's emerging right there on channel nine. Now at first it's green, uh, and it's gonna turn yellow and then red here pretty quick because this device, whatever it is, it talks constantly. It's just like an air horn. Now fortunately, it hasn't landed directly on the same channel as the plank, but it's definitely causing some noise to come up here um, on this channel. So our Wi-Fi devices are going to have a little bit more of, they're going to have a little bit more trouble hearing that access point because of that noise that is coming from this non-Wi-Fi device. So let's go ahead and uh, let's uh, see if we can figure out what this device is. To do that, I'm going to hide the networks. Let's just get them out of our way. And then I'm going to visit the interferers tab. This tab is a library of common and shapes or signatures of things that you might see in the spectrum. So what you can do is you can scroll through this and you can kind of eyeball it to see whether it matches up or not. And if you think that something looks like it might match, then you can actually click on it to select it. And then you can hover your mouse up here over the density view and you can hover it to see if it matches up. Now I'm gonna say that that's probably not an AV transmitter. That doesn't look like an AV transmitter at all. So that's probably not what it is. So let's go ahead and continue our search. Now it does kind of look like this RFID reader, but not quite. It's just not quite the right shape. It's close, but no cigar. But it does look a lot like this Uniden cordless phone. And so when I hover my mouse here, we can see that it matches up perfectly with that Uniden cordless phone signature. So that must be it. That must be 
our, that must be what we're looking for. Okay, so now we've identified that this is probably a cordless phone of some kind, probably a Uniden cordless phone to be more exact. And we know that it's definitely gonna cause some problems with our wireless network. Fortunately, it's not on the same channel, but it's definitely bringing up the noise on that channel. We can't move this, uh, we can't move this device over to channel 11. That's another possibility, but we can't do it in this scenario because channel 11 would be right about there and it's pretty much right on top of that, that cordless phone. So we really need to track this thing down and get rid of it. To do that, we're gonna use a function called device finder. Device finder allows us to, uh, to select this device and then actually go track it down. It gives us a signal strength graph for this device. So to enter device finder mode, I'm gonna click and drag over that shape in the density view. I'm gonna release my mouse and click on device finder. And then I have a nice little chance here to kind of clean up my selection a little bit. We're just gonna kind of bring it a little bit tighter here. And then I'm gonna hit the checkbox to start device finder mode. Now we get a signal strength graph for the device that we have selected. And the Y spy concentrates on this device only to give us faster readings. So now we can see our signal strength is kind of low, but if we walk around a little bit, we might see our signal strength go up a little bit. And if we keep walking, we might see that signal strength go back down a little bit. And so we're gonna keep kind of playing this game of hot and cold, kind of looking around, looking for this device that's causing interference until eventually we see the signal strength go way high and we realize that we are probably in the same room as that device. Then we could start looking for it and we go, ah, there it is. There's that unit in cordless phone. And that's when you snatch it out of the hand of whoever's using it and turn it off, you know, because they're causing problems. And then when you turn that cordless phone off, you'll see that signal strength fall to zero. I don't actually recommend snatching a phone out of somebody's hand. You, you Maybe you could be more polite and just, you know, wait a couple minutes till they're done with their call. But either way, we have located this device and we've turned it off. So now it is no longer transmitting. It's not going to be basically jamming our network anymore. So that is the, uh, the device finder functionality. Now there's another view down below that I want to show you. We've talked about the density view up here at the top. The next thing that I want to talk about is the waterfall view down here on the bottom. The waterfall view is interesting because it shows us a rolling time span of what's happening in our environment. So uh, let's grab our, our trusty cordless phone here and I'll turn it on. And what you'll notice is that this time, ooh, this cordless phone is especially devious. It likes to pick a new frequency uh, whenever, usually when you hit the talk button. So you can see that it's, it's centered right here just above channel 13. And you'll notice that we've got this, this red stripe that starts out here in the waterfall view. The beginning of that stripe shows us when that cordless phone started to talk. And if we turn the cordless phone off again, you'll notice that the, the red stripe will go away because now that cordless phone is no longer transmitting. Let's try to turn it back on and see if it switches channels. Sure enough, we can actually see where the cordless phone switched from one channel to another. Now, one thing to keep in mind about the waterfall view is that the color scheme is a little bit different. Up here, the color scheme shows us a percentage of how often a frequency is being used, right? Down here on the waterfall view, the color tells us how loud something is. It shows us the amplitude of devices uh, of devices, and how loud they're talking. Notice that the tallest part of the, of the density view directly corresponds to the most red part of the waterfall view. That's because those are two different representations of amplitude. So it can show us what's happening over time and it shows us in a rolling time span. Now you may have noticed that there's actually an identical waterfall view over here on the left-hand side. This waterfall view is the exact same visualization, exact same thing, except instead of showing us a rolling time span, it shows us the entire recording session from start to finish. So down here at the bottom, this is where we began our recording session. And up here at the top, this is live. This is what's happening right now. So there's some interesting things that we can do here. One thing that we can do is we can hit the pause button and you'll notice that it freezes the entire application. So we've, we've basically hit pause on this thing. Whereas over in the waterfall view, you'll notice that it's still recording in the background. We can actually see if that cordless phone just turned on again. You probably heard me hit the talk button again when I powered it back on. So channelizer is kind of like a DVR. You can pause it, but it will continue to record in the background. And now if we hit play, it's gonna resume playback, but now it's a couple of seconds delayed. Now we can either hit jump to live data to jump to what's happening right now, or we can just grab these and move them up to the top to actually look at, at what's happening in the spectrum right now. We can rewind as well, so we can pause it, and we can, uh, we can grab these uh, navigation playheads and pull them back, and we can look at different points in time simply by repositioning the navigation playheads. 
We can also select different time spans. Right now, we have selected a 30 second time span. So the waterfall view is showing us 30 seconds of data and the density view is also showing us 30 seconds of data. So for the 30 seconds of data that we have selected right now, you can see what we have selected right now, we are coloring this green, which means during that time period, we saw 20% utilization on that channel from that device. The entire application works on whatever time span you currently have uh, have selected in the spectrum. Now you can change the time span with a plus or minus buttons. So we can bump it up to a minute, we can bump it up to two minutes, and you can also grab the navigation playheads individually to select uh, to select a custom time span. So we can select a custom time span like 10 seconds in this example when we had this cordless phone on for 10 seconds. So it's very customizable in how much data you can select and, and how you can rewind. You can also save these recordings off and you can play them back later. In fact, we're gonna do that right now. I'm actually gonna go to the Learn tab and I'm gonna go to the Recordings uh, feature here. And th these are some sample recordings that we have included with the software. Now, um, there's one I want to show you here. It's called 802.11b and 802.11g. So I'm going to go ahead and start this, uh, start up this recording. And let's take a look at what happened throughout this recording. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pause the recording. So it's not going to play back. And I'm going to go to the networks table. And we're going to get rid of our MetaGeek filter here. I'm going to holster the cordless phone here. Put it back on its charger. I'm going to clear the, clear the, the MetaGeek uh, filter here. And I'm going to type in one just called 802.11. I set up two access points in this environment. Um, one of them is called 802.11b, and one of them is called 802.11g. Let's see, did I mess up my filter? Maybe we can grab these manually. Let's just grab them manually. So I'm actually going to uncheck all of my networks here to get rid of them. I'm just going to put a checkbox next to 802.11b and another one next to 802.11g. So what you can see that I've done here is I've put one 802.11g access point up here on channel 11, and then another one down here on channel 1. This access point is an old 802.11b access point, very old one, and this is an 802.11g access point. Then what I did next is I ran a throughput test on them so we could see what Wi-Fi looks like when it's very, very busy. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the channels table, and I want to keep an eye on the percentage of utilization on channel 11. Let's see how often this channel gets used as I play back the recording. So now we're playing back the recording and you can see where I started my throughput test here. This is just like a speedtest.net. In this case, I was using a, a throughput testing tool called iPerf just between a couple of laptops. One of them connected to the wireless network. One of them is on the ethernet side of the network. So we can see that 802.11g makes this flat tabletop shape with shoulders down each side. That's what both 802.11g and 802.11n look like. Now as we get into, as uh, this throughput test fills up our time span, you can see that we have hit a utilization of about 83% here. So it actually tells us that that, that channel is being used 83% of the time, about 73% of the time now. So that tells us how much capacity is left in that channel not much. That channel is very, very busy. There's not a lot of time left on that channel for other devices to talk. Okay, so now let's fast forward and let's take a look at the 802.11b throughput test. So I'll go ahead and play that back and this time we're going to keep an eye on the utilization on channel 1. So right now it looks like we're at about 16%, 21% and this will climb to about 85% as this throughput test runs, as it plays back in this recording. And also, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the shape, I'm gonna go ahead and advance it a little bit here, I'm a little impatient to wait for that. You can see that it is dark red, which means it is talking constantly, peaking out at 88% utilization. It's basically keeping that channel as busy as possible. That channel is very, very busy. Also notice the shape. 802.11b uses a different way of talking, a different modulation scheme in the spectrum. So it makes a curve shape instead of the flat tabletop shape that you saw with 802.11g and 802.11n. So you can use the tool to see exactly how often each channel is being used, exactly how saturated each wireless channel is. Now what I'd like to do is I want to show you a few examples of different things that you might see in the spectrum. We just saw this one in action. This is what 802.11b looks like. This means that we're using a slower, older data rate, like 1 or 2 or 5.5 or 11 megabits per second. So it's an older, slower data rate, and it makes this curve shape in the spectrum. Now you might see 802.11g and 802.11n devices fall back to, to, to this shape as well. If a device is very, very far away from the access point, 
uh, then the, the access point and the client device might have to slow down to this legacy data rate to make sure that they can maintain their conversation. They're going to basically slow down and enunciate as they move away from the access point. So you may see an 802.11g or n network do this. This is what 802.11g and n look like. This means that a faster data rate like 6 or 9 or 12 or 18 megabits per second and beyond is in use. And it makes this flat tabletop shape with the shoulders down each side. Now you're not gonna always see those shoulders. Um, the main reason why we can see the shoulders in this example is because the, the signal strength of this is really loud. We're at negative 40 dBm, which is a very, very loud signal strength. If it was only at negative 60 dBm, which is a bit more typical, then those shoulders would be almost invisible. They would be kind of below the water line, so to speak, and so you're typically not going to see those shoulders. We didn't get a chance to look at the five gigahertz band, uh, but this is, uh, this is a screenshot of what five gigahertz looks like with a lot of 802.11a and 802.11n networks uh, with one notable one this guy here on channel 56 this one is keeping the channel 50, uh, uh, the, keeping the channel busy 50 percent of the time or more that's a very very busy channel now one thing i want you to notice is that each of these they're the same 20 megahertz wide channels they're all 20 megahertz wide we just have to squish down the five gigahertz band to fit it onto the screen so they look a lot narrower than, uh, than they are, They're the same width as they are in 2.4. Five gigahertz is just huge by comparison. Now here's a fun one, this is a frequency hopping baby monitor. This one's really frustrating because kind of like the cordless phone, it likes to change channels. Let's take a look at what happened here in the waterfall view. We can see that this cordless phone started out right here on channel five. So you can see it hanging out right there on, on channel five and it hung out there for about four seconds or so. And then it hopped all the way up here to Wi-Fi channel nine and then it hung out there for another four seconds or so. It seems to be the pattern that it likes. And then it hopped all the way down here to channel one. And that was a bad idea. That was a bad channel decision because if you look closely on channel one, there is an 802.11g or 802.11n network on this channel. And so now that baby monitor is gonna completely interrupt that network and it'll only interrupt it for about four seconds or so before it's gonna switch to a different channel because this baby monitor likes to switch channels every four seconds or so. And that's gonna cause the Wi-Fi to work and then not work and then work and then not work and then work and then not work, which is gonna be really frustrating for uh, anyone who's trying to use the network. This is what Bluetooth looks like. Bluetooth is also frequency hopping, but it's a fast frequency hopping protocol. It moves very, very quickly. It only stays on each channel for about one millisecond or so. Very, very quick. In fact, you can see all the different hops all over the place. Each one of these blue spikes represents a series of Bluetooth hops on that channel. Now, Bluetooth gets a pretty bad rap. People like to blame Bluetooth for, for interference all the time. But I'm here to tell you that I don't think Bluetooth is usually to blame. Um, if you'll notice the color here, look at the color. The color is blue, which means this Bluetooth device is only utilizing the band about 10% of the time, maybe 15% of the time here at these lower amplitudes along the bottom. Is 10% utilization going to seriously impact the performance of a wireless network? No, it's not. The network is still going to have 90% of the channel left to talk. And this is an extreme example, by the way. Bluetooth is very hard to get to show up on a spectrum analyzer because it's so quiet, it's so quick, and it's so fast. In fact, throughout our entire spectrum analysis demo, I was using a Bluetooth mouse, a Bluetooth keyboard, and I have a Bluetooth smartwatch on right now. And we didn't see any Bluetooth activity in the spectrum. It's fast, it's quiet, and it doesn't typically cause a noticeable amount of interference. The same goes for Xbox 360 controllers. They're not the same protocol, but they're the same idea. They are also frequency hopping devices, but again, look at the utilization. Each one of these spikes represents a, a series of hops by a, uh, an Xbox 360 controller, and you'll notice that they're all blue, which means it talked less than 10% of the time. We're talking maybe 1% of the time here. It's not going to significantly impact the performance of your wireless network. Now, here's something that will impact the performance of your network. This is an old analog wireless video camera. The, this, these used to be marketed as X10 wireless video cameras. They make a very distinctive three spike shape in the spectrum, and they are dark red, which means they are talking constantly like an air horn. These are bad, bad, bad. They will completely wreck your wireless network. And that about wraps up what I had for this, uh, this presentation. Uh, I think now I'm going to go ahead and pass it back over to Julie so we can take some questions. Joel, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. We enjoyed it very much. And it looks like we do have some questions. Let me start to share them with you. 
Uh, let's go with the first one. Uh, let's see, we get a question here that says, um, can we do a product overview on these lines? Meaning, can we set up a webinar and run a mock test with the equipment and you sharing your screen showing what I would see when I am on site? We could probably do that. Um, I would recommend contacting the Microcom sales team and we could probably get that set up uh, through then. I'd be more than happy to help with that. And we may do a webinar at some point in the near future, just kind of like a product overview of all of, all of our different products since we only focused on one today. But I, I would recommend contacting the Microcom sales team about that and we can collaborate. Excellent, thank you very much. I've got another question for you. Uh, it says here, what if I'm using 900 megahertz or seven or 11 uh, gigahertz. Is there a need for spectrum analysis on these frequencies? You know, uh, it depends, it really does. Um, we actually used to offer a 900 megahertz spectrum analyzer uh, several years ago. We, we did discontinue that due to lack of interest in the product. Um, there absolutely is a, it's kind of a, a niche need for spectrum analysis in 900 megahertz. Um, I don't know anything about 700 megahertz, but I know that 900 megahertz is also unlicensed spectrum. And uh, the, uh, the IEEE recently ratified an amendment to the 802.11 standard bringing uh, 802.11 AH into the fold. That is a 900 megahertz uh, standard for, or a 900 megahertz amendment for Wi-Fi. So far, exactly zero products have been introduced that support 802.11 AH, but it's, it's probably gonna happen before too long. So we don't make a spectrum analyzer that works in 900. Uh, but there are definitely other companies that do. So, you know, uh, hit up your good friend Google and uh, look, at, look around out there. Uh, and there definitely are some other spectrum analyzers out there that support the 900 megahertz band. By the time you get up to like 11 gigahertz, um, the range on 11 gigahertz is going to be so short that I, I don't know whether you truly need it there or not. It's going to be really up to you. I don't know anything about what is up in 11 uh, gigahertz spectrum because I pretty much concentrate on the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands. But I guarantee you there's, there's a spectrum analyzer out there that can do it. There's a spectrum analyzer for everything out there. In this case, though, it's probably just not the Y spy. Thank you very much. Got another question here for you. Can you repeat the golden rule of Wi-Fi? Um, it is one, six, and seven, is that correct? Uh, close, very close. Uh, let me recall my slide really quick here. The golden rule of Wi-Fi is to use the three channels that do not overlap, and that's channels one, six, and 11. Those are the three channels that do not overlap in the 2.4 gigahertz band. In the five gigahertz band, go nuts. You can use any of the 20 megahertz channels that you want, they're not gonna overlap, but in, uh, in 2.4, you always wanna use channels one, six, and 11. That's the golden rule of Wi-Fi. Thank you very much. I've got another question here for you. How many Wi-Fi devices do you see or could perhaps predict uh, households will have in 2025? Oh man, I can't even begin to imagine what it's gonna be like. Um, the 802.11 uh, standard was actually ratified in 1997. And the original purpose for the standard, as far as I know, uh, was actually to unify barcode scanners in warehouses to, to make it so all, a bunch of barcode scanners could interoperate with each other without having to you know, buy a whole bunch of equipment. Basically, you can mix brands and access points and things like that. I don't think they had any idea. You know, YouTube, what's that in 1997? I mean, nobody had a clue where this was going. And now Wi-Fi is just an integral part of our lives. And uh, I mean, most houses already, it's not uncommon to see two, three, four, maybe even five Wi-Fi devices per person. And now, you know, a big buzzword right now is the internet of things. Uh, that's gonna introduce even more Wi-Fi devices. I couldn't, I couldn't even possibly begin to know how many devices we will see per household in 2025, but it could be just absolutely nuts. One thing's for sure, we are already starting to feel the strain of limited spectrum. There's only enough spec, there's only so much spectrum and we're pretty much using all of it at this point. So this is only gonna get more challenging as time goes on. Thank you, Joel, very much. Got a couple more questions for you. Um, are there any training features on your website for self-help features or samples of this information? Uh, would love uh, the, the asker here says that they would love to check it out if it's there. Yes, absolutely. If you go to support.metageek.com, again, that's support.metageek.com, or just go to the help section on our website, that'll take you to, to support.metageek.com. There is an entire knowledge base 
of, uh, of examples of, of things that you might see in the spectrum, articles that show you how to use the individual features in the software. Uh, there's YouTube videos, most of them by yours truly. Uh, go check that out. There's a, there's a big resource there. And of course, if you have any questions, you can always contact us by opening, us, opening up a support ticket uh, using uh, the, uh, the, the function that's basically on, it's on every single page on our website. There's a little support ticket button you can use to get in, in touch with us. Thank you very much. I have a last question here for you. Uh, let's see, how do I access the channelizer? In other words, is it a virtual download or a software CD that I can install on a device? You know, we, we stopped shipping uh, compact discs a few years ago when we realized that most of, most new laptops, I mean, I haven't had a CD drive on a laptop in years now. Um, the way that you get Channelizer is uh, buy it. You know, if you've got to buy it. Um, there's two components involved here. There's the software, Channelizer, and then there's the hardware, which is the Y-Spy. It's a USB spectrum analyzer, plugs in with a USB cable to your laptop. Um, so to actually get the software, once you've made the purchase, then you'll just go to metageek.com forward slash downloads, or just go to our website and click on downloads. Uh, and then you can just download it and install the software, and then it runs locally on your machine. It'll run on Windows, uh, Windows Vista, if anybody's using that, I highly doubt it. Uh, it runs on Windows Vista, Windows 7, 8, and 10. Great. Thank you very much, Joel. Thank you for that wonderful webinar presentation. We appreciate it. And I'd also like to thank everyone for attending today. And if anyone has any other questions, feel free to contact your sales rep or contact us at sales at microcom.com. <laughs> if you wish to view any of the products mentioned here shown today or this entire presentation, visit us at www.microcom.us. And please remember, this webinar presentation has been recorded and it will be uploaded to our Microcom YouTube channel. So if you'd like to reference it again and view it all again, you can certainly do it there on YouTube. Thank you again, Joel. We love the presentation and thank you everybody. Have a great day.